in the Arava Desert, the third most extreme desert in the world. When we got out of the van, it was the end of the day, and the van's air conditioned, and we opened the doors, and it was like, oh my god, we're hit. We are just hit. And I say, oh, I'm sure the whole place works on solar. And of course it didn't, and when I understood that nobody was gonna do it, I said, this I'm gonna do. And I thought it was gonna be easy. <laughs> You know, when you think about it, you really can't run a modern day economy without available fuel and gas. I mean, for this car specifically, but also for Israel at large. Because we're an island economy, we have a large defense force. We need to have ongoing and available fuel and gas in this country. During the Arab Spring in 2011, the natural gas pipeline from Egypt to Israel was blown up not one, not two, but four separate times leaving Israel desperate for a reliable source of energy. In the 1970s, regional instability caused the cost of oil to spike more dramatically than ever before in history. This impacted the global economy and especially the United States. Energy independence is hugely important for any country, but in Israel, it's a necessity. We're here because Delik and other companies have discovered a huge, huge amount of gas, mm -hmm. of natural gas, uh, just out that way. If it's been there for so long and no one knew it was there, yeah. there's clearly some kind of like magic or genius that went into the process. I don't know if uh, genius, but like a mix of uh, science and guts and some uh, belief. In the turn of the century, and Noble made two modest-sized discoveries. The first discovery, it was about one billion cubic meters, enough to supply about a year or so of uh, gas demand here in Israel. Shortly after, the Mary B field was discovered, and that's a much more significant field. That basically started natural gas here in Israel. But in 2009, we made a much more significant discovery, which was Tamar, and that's close to 13 TCF. Okay. So that for decades for to decades. come. So a lot, a lot of gas. A lot of gas. And then a year after, we discovered Leviathan, and that's twice as large. So six, seven decades in current consumption rates. This was a $3 billion project. But when they talk about future projections of what it's going to do to our economy, it's, it's enormous. Even five years ago, no one in their right mind would have thought that Israel is going to export petroleum to neighbors. We're now uh, actively exporting to Egypt and to Jordan from Leviathan. That's really significant, uh, not only from an energy perspective, but like geopolitical perspective, that's huge. The discovery of natural gas turned the tides for Israel, making us not only energy independent, but a global powerhouse in the energy sector. Still, natural gas alone is not enough. The world today very much depends on oil, which has yet to be discovered in Israel. But with a little faith, all things are possible. When we talk about the future of Israel's energy grid, that story cannot be told without speaking with Yosef Abramovich. He's this country's founding father of solar energy. We had moved from Boston to a small kibbutz in the Arava Desert, the third most extreme desert in the world. When we got out of the van, it was the end of the day, and the van's air conditioned, and we opened the doors, and it was like, oh my god, we're hit. We are just hit. And I say, oh, I'm sure the whole place works on solar. And of course it didn't, and when I understood that nobody was gonna do it, I said, this I'm gonna do. And I thought it was gonna be easy. <laughs> so there wasn't. Yeah. We need to come up with a business model called the Arava Company. But it was the first, and the first always the hardest in every market. Plus, I was just hit with this crazy vision. Wow, wouldn't it be cool if we got the whole mm -hmm. area, the south of the country, from the Red Sea to the Dead Sea, to go 100% daytime solar by 2020. Like, I was just like on fire about that. And everyone, again, was just like. Yeah, it's not gonna happen. It's, 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 it's technically not feasible, financially it's not feasible.
So you built this first field, yeah. and you're somehow victorious. <laughs> what was the battle to get this approved? What was the battle to get through the, the red tape on this, on this project? So the state would essentially, the first megawatts would have to essentially be subsidized to be able to jumpstart an entire industry. So you can understand some objection. There's no technical expertise in the country. The yeah. gas companies, everybody tried and no one could break through. And I think because we were coming from a place of values, because we wanted to do something majestic and good for the environment as well, we, they reluctantly gave us like uh, a pass when they opened the doors just a little bit. Did you see a substantial shift in the way people look the, the notion of clean or green energy after this happened or during the process? Was there something click we, in the, we in the saw heads of people? Really clearly, 14 years later, <laughs> in other words, today. Today, we're celebrating a whole year. This is the first region in the world to be 100% solar powered during the day. Amazing. Yosef and his team had to do everything from raising capital to lobbying for changes to Israeli energy laws. In the process, the minds and hearts of Israeli leaders were opened and they welcomed solar energy to this country. But Yosef didn't stop there. So there's 600 million people in Africa without access to power. And the population of the continent is going to double in one generation. Wow. Most important value to me is that we're all created in God's image. And that, therefore, we're all endowed with the right to dignity. The dignity of real education, can't have it without power. Dignity of health care, the dignity of a job and a growing economy that, that, that needs to be able to create these jobs. None of it is possible without electricity. In the Bible, in the Garden of Eden, God creates a beautiful universe and gifts it to humanity to work it and to also guard it. So what's stronger than partnering with an orphan youth village and having that income cover uh, all the health care costs plus, you know, for 500 orphans? So it's all, it's all connected. This is like, uh, um, I'm actually, um, I had a last for words. Yosef is someone who practices what he preaches. His own nuclear family reflects his desire to impact those in need. Together with his wife Susan, Yosef raised five children, two of whom were adopted from Ethiopia and given a renewed chance to thrive in the promised land. Because when someone's life mission is based on biblical values, their business ventures and their private life are often indistinguishable. Thank you for joining us as we provide a spiritual insight of what God is doing in Israel and in the Middle East. If you want to learn more about what God is doing in Israel, make sure to visit us on our webpage and follow us on social media. Shalom and God bless you for Jerusalem.